Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us today. Uh, welcome to our second webinar in our new perspectives on park partnerships series for uh, 2020. So today's webinar is a second part on um, uh, what to know before entering into your park partnerships. My name is Rachel Yanchishin, uh, and I am a project manager for the National Network here at Park People, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's webinar. So a few notes to start with, if you're having any technical issues or any trouble seeing or hearing us, you can let us know by uh, using the chat function. In Zoom, it's a little icon that appears on your Zoom window if you move your mouse over your Zoom window. Uh, we'll have a question and a discussion period at the end of the presentation. So, um, but feel free to chat at any time. Uh, we're gonna use the Q&A to field those questions. So if questions come up for you, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, and we'll, we'll address them at the end of our presentation. Uh, and when you're chatting, be sure to choose to chat to all panelists and attendees. It's a little uh, option you can choose in your chat box so everybody can, uh, we can share together. Uh, we also have Stephanie Stanoff on the line, helping out with our technical things of our, of our uh, presentation. Um, and again, we encourage everyone to ask questions and participate um, as we'd like the webinar to be as interactive as possible. Um, I thought it'd be kind of fun. We've done quite a few webinars recently and there's a raise hand function in your Zoom window to do, could I get people to raise their hand if they've participated in a Park People webinar before? Great, so great to see so many of you back. Welcome and welcome to anyone who's with us for the first time. We are recording our webinar today. Uh, it will be available on the Park People website for future reference. Um, and for city park staff and other park professionals, we're thrilled that these webinars are offered as learning credits for the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association's Professional Development Certification Program. If you have any questions around that, please feel free to be in touch. So it would be great to see who's joining us today. We have a good number of people on the line. Um, if you could use the chat window and let us know what city uh, in the country you're joining us from, it would be great. It would be great to see that. So go ahead and pop that in the chat window. We're also going to hear more details about your park partnerships and ideas for you um, that work um, uh, later on in the webinar. So just a brief introduction to um, Park People. I can just go to the next slide. So we are um, an, a national network that helps people activate the power of parks to improve the quality of life in cities across Canada. So our, our national network program provides comprehensive support to grassroots community groups nonprofit organizations and municipal staff across the country who are working to animate and enhance their local parks. Programs like this webinar series aim to provide communities with tools and inspiration they need to animate and improve city parks, to facilitate information exchange and peer learning between Canadians, as well as bringing innovative city park ideas and projects to life through new partnerships and research. We're coming together virtually here today um, under unprecedented circumstances. So we really want to thank you for all that you've been doing so far and continuing to do to keep yourselves and your community safe and healthy. Uh, during this situation, we've seen such an appreciation for using and loving our parks like never before. And so with such interest in our parks, we thought this conversation around bringing partners together in parks is very timely. So I'm pleased to introduce Two of my coworkers today are panelists. Um, we have Dave Harvey and Natalie Brown. Dave has decades of experience working in government on municipal and environmental issues. He excels at bringing partners together and strategic thinking to overcome complex challenges. He's passionate about community involvement in parks, which is why he founded Park People in 2011. And Natalie is Park People's Director of Programs. She leads Park People's work with local partners in Montreal, Vancouver, and the GTHA to deliver new and expanded programs. Natalie spent many years in the municipal sector and is familiar with the challenges and opportunities of public sector NGO partnerships from both sides of the equation. So uh, thanks again for sharing with us where you're joining us from, and I will pass it over to Dave. Thanks, Rachel. Um, our goal for the webinar is that sort of by the end of this hour, you'll have learned about the key elements that make a park partnership successful. Sort of, you know, regardless of the scale, location, or type of park, um, we're going to draw examples of partnerships between municipalities and nonprofit organizations 
right across Canada and touch on key mistakes to avoid when embarking on new partnerships. So we're just going to do a quick refresher to begin with about our first webinar, go through some of those determinants of successful key partnerships, um, park partnerships. We're going to highlight mistakes to avoid, um, give you a few big takeaways and leave lots of time at the end for uh, Q&A. On to the next one. So uh, many of you will be here, would have been here for the first webinar on Park Partnership Trends in Canada. Uh, and if you missed it, I think they're going to be putting up a, a link in the chat window. Uh, but just very quickly, the key points that we brought up were, uh, we're seeing more interest in, in partnerships in cities right across Canada. Uh, the progress in partnerships involves a whole range of partnerships from uh, volunteer park friends groups to very high capacity park conservancies. Um, but overall, Canada is very different than the U.S. In the U.S., we're seeing very large-scale park conservancy partnerships in almost every city. And in many cases, some of them, you know, they're, they're up to billions of dollars in raising funds and really replacing core city park services. And that's not what we're seeing in Canada. Um, and we noted that even before COVID, cities across Canada were, were really interested in partnerships, but finding it hard to find some of the philanthropic funds for parks. Um, and during the first webinar, we got lots of great questions, and some of them were on a lot more specifics than the sort of the general themes that we were dealing with, which was the overall trends in parks in Canada on partnerships. And so those questions that relate more to today's webinar, we're going to be trying to answer as we go along, particularly those around uh, governance, funding sources, and roles and responsibilities. So very quickly, what do we mean by park partnerships? Uh, we're not really talking about one-off event partnerships or sponsorships. Partnerships are more about, you know, building on an ongoing relationship with an outside organization, usually some kind of nonprofit. Um, you know, these can exist in formal, you know, city parks, but also other areas like plazas, community housing, electricity corridors. Uh, they involve some level of uh, shared responsibility and roles. It could be around programming, design, community engagement, natural stewardship. Uh, and they can exist on a scale from informal to formal. They could be a very informal uh, volunteer park friends group doing a cleanup in the stewardship work, all the way up to a big conservancy running the entire park. But for today's purposes and this webinar, we're going to be focusing only on those more formal partnerships. Uh, they can still be somewhat of a smaller scale, but the kind of partnerships we're going to be talking about today include written agreements, some level of funding or fundraising, usually some level of staffing, and a higher capacity than the regular volunteer groups. And who are we talking to today? Um, all of you right across Canada, um, but particularly, you know, sort of our target audience isn't just one side. We're not just talking to city staff or NGOs. We're talking to all sides of the partnerships. So that's cities, NGOs, community funders, business community. Um, all sides of a successful partnership um, need some of these tips uh, to make them successful. Great. Uh, thanks, Dave. So we'll spend a good chunk of time moving forward talking about some of the key determinants of a successful park partnership. And I'm going to run through four of them before handing it over to Dave to share some others. And for each example, we'll touch on uh, an example from across Canada and share how the key determinant is reflected in their situation. The first one is uh, a key determinant of success is ha to have a set of shared objectives that all partners understand. And uh, this quote I read recently in a partnership handbook really resonated with me, which is that perhaps the only thing that all partners have in common at the start of any partnership is the uncertainty about each other, partnership itself, and what it's going to demand of them. And in that context, this is really the first conversation to have. And it's about defining not just your objectives for what you'd like to accomplish together in the park, but also what you want to get out of the partnership itself, uh, what you're expecting from each partner in terms of what they're going to be bringing to the table and what you hope to be able to do as you work together as partners. And this is a great opportunity to build trust and to set the tone for the partnership to come by practicing a lot of honesty and transparency about why it is you're at the table and what you're trying to achieve together. And this kind of frank discussion at the top can help ensure that you really do have enough alignment to be effective partners and that the motives that you're bringing to the table for the partnership are well aligned enough that you'll be able to be successful together. And there's a couple of really simple key questions you can ask when you're trying to clarify that, that set of shared objectives at the top. And when you're thinking about, for the first question, what the overall goal is that you're trying to achieve, why does it need to be done in partnership? And this seems really straightforward, but it can actually reveal a lot and help surface what it is that the partnership itself uh, needs to do. 
And you'll need this information in order to shape each partner's role and also to get buy-in from stakeholders on both sides who might need to be convinced about the value of doing something in partnership. And if you can't get to a satisfactory answer about why it is you need to do this in partnership, then it's a bit of a warning sign to take a step back and think about what it is you're trying to accomplish and whether a partnership is what you need. And a second question that is very simple but can also be really revealing is to try to answer why your partner is at the table and try to share and, and repeat back what the other person's, the other partner's value is in your own words. And that can help reveal some unspoken assumptions about what you think the other partner can or should be doing. And it, again, great to get those out on the table at the start and so that everybody has as much clarity um, about what the expectations are as possible right at the beginning. I'm really excited to share this example because we have a, a great strong contingent of Edmonton folks in the virtual room today. And this is a really unique nonprofit, uh, the River Valley Alliance. And it's a nonprofit that represents seven municip municipalities that border the North Saskatchewan River in the Edmonton region. And they have a very clear and compelling shared objective, which is to create a continuous connected trail system within the River Valley that crosses all of their municipalities. And they ended up with a totally unique nonprofit structure that stemmed from that shared objective to actually create one a nonprofit that's made up of municipal representatives. And that structure has enabled them to be very successful in engaging other levels of government to support capital projects uh, in the Valley that, that will allow them to realize their objective. So a really interesting study and I'd be curious to hear from folks during the Q&A if those of you around the room who might be more familiar with it. The next objective is to be very clear that each side should be bringing di different strengths to the partnership and to define roles based on those different strengths and capacity. It's really the diversity of backgrounds and knowledge and capacity that makes a partnership worthwhile. Uh, you should be doing it because the partner is bringing something to the table that you can't. And that collectively you can go, go further and do more together than you could separately. And it's important in this context to acknowledge that in a lot of partnerships and parks, there's power imbalances and uh, that those are inherent to working together and that clarifying and being upfront about those at the beginning is really critical. I'm um, thinking about, for example, the partnership between a small nonprofit and a large public sector entity. Uh, if there's folks on either side who, who aren't bought into this notion of working together and don't recognize and truly appreciate the strengths that each partner is bringing to the table, then you've got some cracks in the foundation as you move forward. And so those things really need to be surfaced and um, thinking about all of the different kinds of value that each partner is bringing to the table and being upfront and frank about those is really critical. Um, it's not necessarily just about money, it's about capacity, history, knowledge, experience, and being on the ground and a whole host of other strengths that each partner brings. This is a, a really interesting example from Quebec City, uh, the Société de la Rivière Saint-Charles. And they're a nonprofit organization that helps to manage, promote, and provide programming uh, along the St. Charles River, which is a, a 32 kilometer linear park that runs right through the city. And they've been working with the city of Quebec since 2002 and uh, had a nice evolution where they started with much smaller projects with very specific contracts, specific roles that each um, uh, partner was bringing. For example, their first project together was a trail naturalization project where the nonprofit was able to hire marginalized youth to do trail restoration in partnership with municipal park technicians. And through that trial and error, they built the trust and they built a really deep understanding of each other's strengths and what each partner was able to bring to the table. And they were able to set the stage for now um, almost 20 years later, the nonprofit being in a position to provide a really broad array of programs and services that are bringing tremendous value to this, this very special park. And uh, one interesting thing to note uh, in the context of, uh, of the Société de la Vie Saint-Charles is we have a case study about them on our website and, and both the city staff and the nonprofit staff involved in this partnership highlighted to us that the level of trust and understanding of each other's strengths uh, it can't be taken for granted and they need to constantly work on it. It needs to be renewed all the time. It needs to be focused on and whenever there's turnover on either side, they need to be thinking about how they rebuild that knowledge and rebuild that trust uh, as they work together. And this is a, a very related key determinant, which is this idea of ensuring very clearly understood roles. So there's no confusion about who's doing what, when, how, and who needs to be consulted when a decision is made. And the keywords here are explicit and written. And so when you get to the stage where you're writing agreements and contracts, everybody needs to understand exactly what's in them and the roles need to be crystal clear before you move forward. And um, it's important to understand that there may be situations where one or the other partner needs to use a templated contract or agreement or something that's standard for them in terms of their own processes. 
but it might not be something that's sufficient to uh, truly capture all the nuances of the partnership or to fully reflect the needs of the other partner. And so it's really worth con considering at this stage whether you need to jointly write something that's completely custom, that defines everything and gets to a level of specificity around roles and responsibilities that will ensure clarity as you move forward. And it's not enough in these kinds of agreements just to have the names of the organizations. You need to get down to the level of detail of the specific roles and thinking about who's making the decisions within each organization. And this is critical because uh, it sheds light on the question of when you're doing a partnership, often you're trying to go further. You're trying to push the boundaries and do something a little bit outside of your normal. And that might mean that your partnership isn't going to dovetail naturally with your existing systems and processes inside your own organization. So you're setting up a situation where you're going to have these new horizontal accountabilities to your partner and vertical accountabilities that you still have within your own organization to your colleagues. And so acknowledging that head on and thinking about how you're striking a balance between those two sets of accountabilities is really critical. And then capturing and enshrining that in writing is gonna set you off really on the right foot as you move forward. Um, Les Amis de la Montagne in Montreal uh, is a wonderful example of this. They're sort of one of the elder statesperson park NGOs in Canada. They've been around since the 1980s and they work very closely through a formal written agreement with the city of Montreal to manage Mont Royal, which uh, I hope many of you have had the chance to visit. It's an incredible park uh, right in the heart of the city. And they uh, have very clearly delineated shared responsibilities. They renew the agreement every few years. It evolves, it's grown with the times from the 80s until now. And uh, it's really rooted in each partner's strength and resources. And it's been fascinating to see right now in the context of the pandemic, how Les Amis de la Montagne, the nonprofit, which is on the ground, on the mountain, uh, they're seeing what's happening has been able to add value. So they were able to actually come to their partners at the municipality and propose a public education campaign to help people understand how to practice physical distancing in the parks during the COVID pandemic, because they saw the need. They saw that there was a lack of clarity among park users, that the public health messaging needed to be reinforced through other trusted voices. And so they proposed that to the municipality. They went forward. They worked with 53 other park organizations across the city of Montreal, including park people. And they were able to send out a shared message to over 600,000 park users that reinforced and clarified what people needed to know in order to use the park safely. And I think that's a really beautiful example of where you see the specific strengths of a nonprofit and then the trusted relationship between that nonprofit and the city, allowing both of them to pivot and be really agile and respond to the needs on the spot. The final key determinant I'd like to chat about before passing things over to Dave is this idea of clarity, openness, and public accountability. And in Canada, like in many other countries, there's real anxieties and concerns about public-private partnerships in general. And when we're talking about public spaces, which people hold so dear, those anxieties are even more acute. We wanna make sure that they're being governed in a way that's responsive to what we want and what we need as, as the public. And so that's why it's so critical to make your decision-making structures as transparent as possible and to ensure that the public knows who's looking after the public interest and thinking about questions like, does the public have a voice in this structure? Does the board that you're creating, if you're creating a new nonprofit, have public representation? Are there public meetings where they have input into park planning and decision making? Um, there's a lot of nuance here, but the great thing is there's also a lot of best practice. There's a lot of policies that have been evolved and developed over the years by park nonprofits and municipalities that can be set up to anticipate some of these conflicts and misunderstandings. And, um, and be able to have a, a system and a structure that provides that clarity and helps build that public trust. And you really need that in order to have the, the wider public be, be happy with how the park is being managed in partnership. And in this context, um, we'll return again to Montreal and to Parc Jean Drapeau, um, which many of you may know as the, the site of Expo 67. It's an incredible urban park, an enormous space uh, in the river off the south shore of Montreal that crosses two islands. And uh, it's governed by a paramunicipal agency called La Société du Parc Jean Drapeau. And they uh, receive about 50% of their revenue directly from the city and work closely with the city, but they also earn about 50% of their revenue from activities on the, on the island, uh, including many large scale events. And in that context, a few years ago, there was a decision to uh, create a new 65,000 seat hardscaped amphitheater to help facilitate some of these large music festivals and other events that that were taking place on the island. And in order to do so, they were going to be cutting down a thousand trees. Uh, and this number became a real flashpoint uh, for the media and the public because it felt like it was very much in contradiction with how many people felt about what they wanted from that park. 
uh, which is that they wanted a green space and they wanted a, a natural retreat that they could get to and that was contributing to the, the viability, the ecological viability of the city. And so there was a big, big outcry, big response in the Office of Public Consultation of the City of Montreal, um, pulled together a consultation, talked over 7,000 Montrealers, and in the end, uh, the conclusion was that they needed to swing the pendulum way back towards the preservation and development of the park's natural heritage. And that set the stage for, for La Société du Parc Jean Drapeau to embark on a new strategic planning process with a very different direction for the park. And so there was a real moment of recalibration and needing um, the structure of the park, the way it was governed, and, and what, what it is trying to accomplish to be realigned back with what the public really wanted to see. And on that note, I'll hand it over to Dave. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so this next key determinant I'm going to talk about for a good partnership is so critical and where so often things can go wrong. Uh, it gets back to some of the objectives and decision making framework that Natalie was talking about just earlier. You know, essentially, if, if X is responsible for doing one, two and three, uh, they need to be able to find the revenues to deliver on those elements and be able to manage and control those costs. Uh, this has to be crystal clear, understood by all parties. Uh, it's great to agree on who's going to be doing maintenance and who's going to be doing programming, but one, you know, how much are these things going to cost? And two, uh, how are these things going to get paid for? It sounds very simple, um, but this is where often things really can kind of break down. Um, and the second issue around funding is, you know, do the revenue options available to the partner match the responsibilities? Uh, if the nonprofit's going to take on responsibilities that say, you know, add up to a million dollars, uh, but the city partner is going to limit their ability to raise revenue, uh, the partnership's just not going to work. Um, you know, can there be concessions in the park? Um, who's going to set up the tender requirements? Who gets the revenues? Uh, can spaces be rented out to third parties? Um, how easily can this be done? Uh, is, and, you know, essentially, like, is the city tying the hands of the nonprofit so that success really is impossible? Um, and, you know, and will the city still have to follow city tending rules and outsourcing rules? So, again, some of these things that, that Natalie mentioned about bringing some of the different elements together between the various parties for the partnerships that, that they can each bring something to the park. It means something too on the, on the um, revenue and expenditure side too. And, and, you know, very key important as well that there needs to be a very thorough and really well thought out revenue plan. Uh, is there a real realistic uh, revenue plan to cover the costs? Um, what could happen potentially say with parking revenues or special events and rentals, donations, corporate sponsorship rules? Um, is there sufficient revenue diversification on the whole partnership so they're not just relying on one funder or one source of revenue? Um, and, you know, this last point is so key here to, to have no surprises. So this is where, you know, changes can get done in the middle of a partnership that can really create some instability, uh, break that trust, and particularly affect the credibility with uh, donors and sponsors. So, you know, very important elements here. Um, and a, and a great success story on um, you know getting it right on uh, where um, sustainable funding is uh, with the Assiniboine Park Conservancy in Winnipeg. Um, it's a 400 acre park with many amenities such as a zoo and a conservatory and the conservancy runs all aspects of the park including concessions and they've raised tens of millions of dollars to revitalize and program the amenities in the park. Um, but when the conservancy was set up uh, there was very key philanthropic commitments right from the start uh, that gave faith to uh, government to match those uh, donations and contributions. Then the city stepped forward and worked very closely with the Conservancy to work for very significant um, federal and provincial capital contributions to the amenities. Um, furthermore, you know, the Conservancy was given quite a bit of significant flexibility for raising revenues, managing costs, and including setting up its own union local. It's the same union that the, all city park staff belong to across the city, but by, because it's its own local, it can create that flexibility to meet the particular needs of the park. Uh, the next key determinant is around uh, sustainable governance. Again, so important. Um, you know, the maturity and the complexity of the governance has to match the amount of responsibility taken on by the partners. Uh, the city has to have faith in the depth and capacity of the potential partner. Is there strong governance, an active, well-connected board, strong leadership and depth uh, in the organization? And, you know, and this can evolve over time. Um, if partnerships just starting out, you, you know, you probably don't have to have charitable status. I think at a minimum, you know, a partner should be incorporated and setting up a not, not profit is, is very simple and that can be done pretty easily. Um, and outside partners can be brought in to bring in additional capacity, 
you know, bring in a charitable trustee, bring in someone who's, who's got some of that core um, uh, uh, elements to, to, to start the organization and get it um, off on a good foot. Um, sustainability is so important. Uh, is the project totally reliant on one funder? Is there just one charismatic founding leader who might not be there forever? You know, is there depth in the board? Um, and similarly on the city side, is the, is the partnership or project being driven by just, you know, one person with, within the city or is there wider buy-in? Um, is it just the local city councillor who's, you know, really driven by this and really trying to set something up? But, you know, what happens if the city councillor isn't around after the next election? Uh, what if that city staff person moves on? So, you know, just setting up the, these core elements around governance for, for the long term is, is vital. And a, and a great example of, of really strong governance uh, here in Toronto is in one of the city's oldest parks where the Friends of Allen Gardens have been partnering with the city to program and support volunteers in the conservatory. Um, the, uh, the Friends started as an informal uh, volunteer group, but over time they've evolved in setting up their own nonprofit, putting in place a really good strong board. Um, they've begun to fundraise and they now have dedicated staff. Uh, and they're now pursuing their, becoming their own charity and they've got long-term plans for raising capital to support renovations in the conservatory. So a real, a real nice success story here in Toronto. Um, and the last key determinant we want to talk about is uh, really about just, you know, it sounds simple, but just start manageable and grow. Uh, be flexible, you know, start small, leave room to evolve, learn, build capacity, build trust. You know, while it's important to be clear about the partner roles and responsibilities, things that we've been talking about, it's also critical to be flexible and open to change and evolution as each partner, you know, grows and, 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 and starts to learn about some of its, its uh, 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 how it can be, you know, um, fulfilling some of these uh, uh, opportunities. Um, and, you know, and potentially, you know, if missteps happen so that you can evolve and make some of those changes to deal with some of those things. Um, this can involve starting small and building on a base of success rather than attempting to start big right out of the gate. Small wins can, can build a, go a long way to establishing a, a positive base of support with the city, other partners, and the public. And, and as I said earlier, I'm a big fan of, of uh, incorporating, becoming that nonprofit, but don't worry too much about getting charitable status. Uh, that can take a long time. It can be really complicated. Find a charitable par partner and do that instead. And uh, a nice example of evolving partnership is the downtown Young Business Improvement Area in Toronto. Uh, the BIA was looking for ideas to animate and improve College Park, which is a, a vital but underutilized park right in the downtown. And they started working with the city to organize one-time music events to the park at lunchtime to bring in crowds. And, but you know, this has been so successful, it's expanded into regular music programming, movie nights, festivals that happen all, all summer long. Um, and then there were some tensions between the city and the BIA at first, but again, they, everyone learns, uh, they build up trust, they, they took their time in this, and, and now the BAA's work includes, uh, in addition to all that other programming, they're actually taking on some additional sort of top-up maintenance to support the city's efforts in the park. And just want to bring up another good example of, uh, of, a, of how this is done with the Bentway in Toronto, uh, which is a public space underneath the Gardner Expressway. Uh, the Bentway Conservancy operates the site, runs programming, does all sorts of community engagement. But to start with, instead of putting all its energy into, into obtaining charitable status, setting up governance structures and office space, uh, the Bentway partnered with a local charity, Artscape, that has tons of great experience um, and capacity as a nonprofit managing artists and gallery spaces and a very strong relationship and, and trust from the city. So by bringing in Artscape as a partner at the beginning, the Bentway could focus on the more important elements, you know, launching the park, getting construction going underway, and not having to worry about, you know, finding phones and, and setting up systems. And just want to spend a little bit of time focusing on some of the, the key mistakes that, that we see too often happen out there with park partnerships. Uh, some of these are going to be repeat points that we made earlier, but these are things we, we really wanted to hammer home with you. So hopefully they, they sink in. So, you know, and the biggest mistake that happens far too often is that the city really only sees the need, you know, they, they see park partnerships as an opportunity to get money um, and just that. And, and park departments, you know, it's tough. They're, they're getting more and more strapped for funding. They're looking for alternative sources to bring in revenue. Um, but if you're just looking for money and not willing to partner and smartly determine shared responsibilities, all these things that, that outside partners can bring to the table 
one, you're not going to have a successful, a successful partnership. And two, you're really not going to find that partner that you want. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's more than just about the money. And, and speaking of, of tight city budgets, you know, um, partnerships fundamentally have to focus on adding value to existing city park services, not replacing what the city, city should be doing. Um, you know, funders aren't interested in, in filling city maintenance budgets for parks. Uh, you know, we're very lucky in Canada that compared to the U.S. where, you know, park partnerships are, are stepping up to, to fill huge, terrible gaps in city core services. We're not seeing that in Canada, and that's definitely not a road we want to go down. And just some additional key mistakes we wanted to highlight, um, you know, just this lack of public accountability that uh, Natalie was talking about. You know, fundamentally, parks are, are publicly owned spaces. If there's a lack of openness, you know, if there's key decisions that are being made in secret, if we're not giving elected representatives a say in what, what's happening in some of those key, key governance elements, um, it's going to lead to trouble in the partnership and things aren't going to go well. Um, second point, um, you know, it's, it's great to have champions in the city leading for a push and, and pulling these partnerships together, but you really need, you know, senior staff buy-in and particularly that political buy-in again, or, or that partnership is, is not going to be sustainable in the long run. And the last common mistake is, is where responsibilities of park are, are, are shared. You know, there's a good division of responsibilities who should be doing what, but the fiscal resources don't match up to the, to the uh, what, what you're asking the different partners to do. And that's where things can go wrong. Over to Natalie with our final key takeaways. Yeah, so we tried to sum up uh, everything that Dave and I just shared in five simple points. Uh, all partners being on the same page about what they're going into the partnership for and what they're trying to achieve and having part of that be very clear understanding of roles and responsibilities and how decisions are made um, which Dave really hit home on this one around the sustainable funding uh, and that being such a critical element to success uh, to setting the partnership up for success um, and that on the funding side as well that it getting funding and getting revenue can't be the only reason that should be driving the partnership. It won't be successful, it'll be difficult to create something on that foundation. And finally, that there's a lot of best practice, there's a lot of resources and examples to draw on from across the country and in other countries as well. But successful partnerships are very context dependent and very specific to the site. And it could be that there's tools and resources at your disposal that are specific to your situation and that are unique and, and might result in something totally different from what, from what the precedents are in other places. So uh, before we turn over to the Q&A, uh, we just wanted to share quickly that we are here to help uh, and we can provide expertise on implementing models at all of these scales in your own specific context. And this can include everything from setting up Park Friends group networks to working on partnership plans and revenue models for a partnership. We've done this work already uh, at each of these scales, uh, including work on projects in Toronto like the Bentley and Allen Gardens, as well as in other cities across Canada like Gatineau and Montreal. And one important thing about the perspective that we bring is how deeply rooted it is in the work that we do and that, that Rachel leads for us with our national network across the country. Uh, we're able to draw on our, our Made in Canada understanding of the park partnership landscape. And rather than relying on conservancy models from the US, we really uh, are able to uh, build solutions and, and work on, on projects with people that are rooted in the Canadian context and that draw on our network of partners and funders and community groups from across the country. Okay, so we've got a, a good amount of time for uh, questions and discussions. Um, uh, thanks to those of you who've already shared. We have a great uh, range of cities represented here um, and I imagine lots of expertise and questions on the line. So um, we are uh, gonna field questions in the Q&A box. So um, you can uh, pop your questions in there and we've got, we've got some um, good opportunity to speak to those. So uh, we'll start with a question from Michael. Um, wondering, could you speak to partnerships between a municipality and a private for, and private for profit entities? Yeah, and again, it was the, the the focus of our webinar was more on these you know more traditional park partnerships which were you know um, from you know th that are nonprofits NGOs you know it, the term often is um, public private partnership but the the private entity that we're usually talking about with these 
uh, are more about um, you know these park conservancy models, the the Bentway model, the Assiniboine Park, Les Amis, all all the the models that we've talked about today um, aren't sort of for private. So it is a, it's a very different type of relationship when it's more on a concession, uh, tendering, you know those types of particular things, and uh, and it's you know it's it's a different type of, of business arrangement for sure. Now, did you have anything to, to add to that or? Yeah, we've got a comment that baby steps, uh, achievable early goals that demonstrate success, show effectiveness, build credibility. This builds the relationship. So thanks, Doug, for, for that point in the chat. Yeah, there's been some, some uh, really good chat brought in there about different ideas that, uh, and, and points from different people and, and just some of those different experiences. And it is amazing. Again, I think it's sort of people think about, you know, the um, Central Park Conservancy or, you know, some of those, those large scale partnerships in the U.S. But there is a whole range of very successful partnerships around Canada. And again, sometimes we get overly caught up with, you know, large amounts of money or things like that. But it's some of those points that Natalie uh, stressed earlier about what different types of partners can bring to that. So, you know, very great things around, you know, programming, arts, uh, natural stewardship, that, uh, you know, it's bringing the best of what the city can bring and what a nonprofit can bring into those different types of arrangements. So um, Heather is asking uh, if we have an example of a model where the park is on private property, but managed by mu the municipality and what key pieces might be included in an agreement. Wow, I'm trying to think. Um, like, I know there are some models out there where there's some unique arrangements and I'd love to see, you know, if, if in the chat or if, if people can, if in different cities, people are seeing some. I know, you know, one example um, is in Toronto with, with Grange Park. Um, the, the land is actually owned by the Art Gallery Ontario, um, but it's managed by the City of Toronto um, in an arrangement. Uh, there's certainly other um, cities where the land could be owned by, you know, the, the province or a conservation authority, or even in some cases, the federal government and managed by the municipality. I'm trying to think of private property. And again, I, you know, and obviously other arrangements, obviously, you know, electricity corridors, it's provincially owned land that's, that's managed by it. But, and again, um, and things that need to be involved in, in those kind of agreements, um, are uh, again, it's almost literally all the different types of things that we brought up. So it's it's some of those key things around which what are um, being addressed in the different areas, um, those difficult things that we didn't bring up around insurance liability, um, and and you know what can be uh, things that need to also be included in there are you know what can be allowed on the land you know with, with the electricity corridors. It's extremely complex, but you know, lots of opportunities around, uh, you know, what could be done in those lands. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Natalie, or? Great. Um, and just a reminder that uh, it's great for people to kind of share their knowledge in the chat window. And there is a little option there to chat to all panelists and attendees. So if you choose to do that, then everybody can see. We're getting some great um, answers from Hazel and Mississauga. So and other people who are participating in the chat window. I've got another question here. Um, are there differences between municipal partnerships versus provincial partnerships? Specifically thinking about the Alberta case of 164 parks or public reserves being handed over to private or nonprofit management. Yeah, again, uh, um, you know, for the, the people who are participating from Alberta, um, we certainly feel for you and that is uh, not uh, the way we think um, that public sector management of, of parks should take place. Um, you know, very concerned with the, the province, you know, what may end up with some of these. And again, there, the idea behind partnerships is, is what different, you know, from, you know, be it from the province or from the city, we, we've talked about cities, but there's, you know, very similar things with the province, say in a provincial park, if they're working on, um, there's, a, you know, say with um, Calgary example, Friends of Fish Creek are, are do some, some great programming in a provincial park in, in Calgary. So there's things that different partners can bring to the table, but when it's a case of a province sort of trying to dump, um, you know, vital, public parks, um, 
you know, not, not a fan of that, not like seeing it done overall like that. Again, if there was individual elements that could be brought to those relationships, that's great. But, um, uh, you know, very concerned with uh, what's going on in Alberta. Um, so uh, Scott asks, um, uh, aware of any examples of municipalities partnering successfully with sports groups operating on municipally owned fields and structures, buildings and structures with shared maintenance agreements, revenue models? Yeah, so there's, there's a, a range of those around. Um, almost every city has different types of arrangements around that. Um, some have, you know, special uh, arrangements they do with um, tennis clubs, lawn bowling clubs. Some of those are, you know, still around. Um, some uh, have deals and that uh, allow for uh, certain sports clubs to, to you know, gain um, more use of the land. And you know, sometimes those are controversial things because it's giving particular preference to one of the one of the partners as opposed to the general public. Sometimes that other partners bringing, you know, additional funds and that they're they're going to uh, upgrade the facilities or things. So it can be, you know, complex um, and, and uh, controversial with some of those, but, uh, the, you know, there's almost every single municipality has, has some kind of special arrangement with those. Um, question for Natalie, actually, uh, one of the key determinants was um, goals, uh, common goals, like what, what might be some examples of a, of a common goal that partners in a park partnership might uh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of partnership objectives specifically, like what, what might be a, a goal there? Um, yeah, I think that, um, often you might have a situation where you've got potential partners like a municipality, a nonprofit or others that have, uh, a vision in common for a particular park or public space. And that's a great starting point. And then the defining of the set of how, of the, of the partnership objective is really about okay with the folks around the table what is each of them able to contribute and how do we see us actually working together and that's where the river valley alliance was interesting in evolving into a nonprofit made up of municipal representatives because it was really that layer of, of municipal shareholders that was needed in order to realize the vision that they had and so they ended up with quite an unconventional structure as opposed to a nonprofit that would be more traditional that would be separate from the municipalities i don't know if that's a, a helpful example to answer your question rachel yeah, and, and there's a, um, it's looking at the chat window here too, there's a question around uh, how much effort in managing the municipal relationship versus getting the job done and who pays for the person to be doing the managing. And, and I think where that, that question is going is just, um, you know, uh, the relationships, you know, building the partnership and maintaining the partnership takes time and effort from both sides. And I think that's, uh, it's, it's something that both sides have to be committed to putting the resources in um, and both sides um, uh, have to be seeing the benefit out of. And again, a lot of these tips that we've given about trying to raise these issues up front, if you deal with the issues up front and are very clear um, on terms of the roles and responsibilities and who does what and who pays for what, hopefully it cuts down on some of those, those ongoing challenges. Uh, those, you know, those headaches and, and lack of clarity and people aren't getting back to me and confusion. Um, so, and it's something, again, and it speaks to when one side really isn't committed to the relationship and partnership when, when these headaches start to happen. Um, and again, in our experience, if you set these things up right from the beginning, you've got a much better likelihood of for success in the long run. Um, we have a question about um, like if we if you the panelists have some thoughts about uh, successful ways to ensure in these partnerships that park jobs of paid employees um, in cities and nonprofits don't get displaced or replaced by unpaid labor of volunteers. Um, Naomi says this has been a major problem throughout the nonprofit sector. I think it comes back to defining the scope of what you're expecting the partnership to accomplish and to Dave's point around uh, not fundamentally building a partnership on replacing core city services that that are currently delivered by by city staff and um, I think that there there needs to be a thought about the value add and what the partnership can be layering on top of what 
already is there. And to the points coming up in the chat around relationship building, one of the really fundamental precursors to that new partnership being successful is that they have really strong relationships with the frontline staff that are already working in the park and that they find a way to add value by working collaboratively and it's not easy but there are a lot of instances where it's it's really effective and some of the parks we've talked about today like Mont Royal or La Rivière saint charles in Quebec City they managed to hit that balance but it it didn't involve subtracting city staff it, it actually involved adding and then allowing them to go further and build a better park and respond better to the needs of park users uh, through adding, but not, a, not replacing. Well, and, and related to that too, um, certainly, you know, at Park People, uh, you know, we're, we're a big fan of partnerships and what various um, sides can all bring to the table to make the parks the, the best we can make them. But, you know, and sometimes we, we, you know, there's different groups that have an idea for a park and the city, you know, has, is, has some concerns over it and the group gets frustrated about why isn't the city saying yes to this and, and often the city's concern is related to this question of it's you know it's a great idea um, they have you know this group has some initial money to get it going but the city's concerned you know three or four years down the road um, are they going to be able to sustain that work and is it the city who already has you know stretched resources going to have to step in and take over this um, and so you know, these are the tough questions you, you ask up front. And, and we've talked today, you know, in, in very, you know, positive terms about partnerships and, and what, what is needed for a partnership. Um, but maybe something we should have mentioned is like just the ability to say no, right? So when, when these things don't line up, um, when you're not seeing the sustainable funding, sustainable governance, you know, you're seeing problems going to happen down the road, you're way better off to say, you know, um, let's, you know, obviously, can these things be fixed? Are there are things that can be brought to the table? Um, but you know, sometimes uh, it's just not going to work out. And better to say no up front rather than um, get going and then have a real mess on everyone's hands. Yeah. So um, a question around sort of that idea of um, maybe evaluating things, getting ahead of things at the beginning. So we have a question about. Um, when facilities or larger assets get involved, say a partner builds a facility, facility on city land, operations begin, and with a few, within a few years, the partner can no longer sustain their end of the partnership and the city is now left to find a new partner or use for this facility. Uh, anything, any advice on what can be done or said in the planning phase of a partnership to mitigate this? Um. Those were some of the things that I was talking about uh, just right there. Yeah, so that's it's the exact same, same kind of things about um, uh, it's, it's all that sustainability, right? So that, uh, you know, a, a real business model, um, how much is it going to cost to maintain this, program this? How are you going to, you know, really raise those revenues? Who's going to be paying for what? And, uh, and if there's concerns over that, you can scale it down, right? So let's start small, um, build trust, build capacity, build faith, gain some experience over time. So you know, and, and again, some of this, it, it, it may be at the end of the day, it's like, no, you know, it's just not going to work out. Uh, Scott asks, any thoughts on navigating towards modernizing agreements with groups who have had informal handshake agreements for a number of years, um, resulting in over-empowering groups and requiring extraordinary municipal resources? <laughs> Natalie? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I actually used to work for the City of Toronto's social housing provider for many years, and we went through an exhaustive and painful process of developing a new partnership policy back in 2012 that involved renegotiating dozens and dozens of handshake agreements with folks who were animating common spaces and public spaces across all the social housing properties. And I will say it wasn't easy. I will say doing it systematically and treating all of the partners across the board through the same process was really critical to building some trust and some faith, but also in pushing back um, against what maybe in some cases had become roles that weren't sustainable in their scope on the side of the partners. Um, but it was really helpful to do more than one at once and to be able to convene multiple small partners together and define a framework and a policy together that everybody could live with. And, um, but it, it took a lot of effort and it was essentially like a special project that had to be taken on. So it was some short term pain in order to get to the long term gain of having much more sustainable and more clearly defined relationships. 
Well, and another tactic that I've seen some cities use is um, sometimes those informal handshake agreements that have done many years ago are with a, a small number of people who have been doing things for a long time. And so there can actually maybe, you know, by the city doing some special one-time top-up things or trying to bring other people to the table. So instead of, you know, a small group doing a small thing that they've always done, um, you know, whatever, it's, it's one community garden or it's, it's one particular element, then there's opportunities to actually think more holistically about the whole space. Um, you know, how about a fall festival? How about a movie night? And then it's bringing in some new blood, some new energy. And it's hard. Some of those groups, you know, it's the same five people who've been doing this for 20 years and that's the way they wanted to say. But um, sometimes, you, you know, by bringing in more people, you actually get a, a, a net positive out of it all. Um, through it all, but it's it's not simple. Great. So thanks again to everyone for your um, your questions and your sharing in the chat window. Uh, it's been great to see uh, all the all the things being put in there. Um, I think we're going to um, continue on and uh, finish up. Uh, thanks everyone for being with us so far. Uh, just, yeah, just um, wrapping up uh, to point people over to um, all the different resources that we have. We've shared some of our case studies and uh, various resources today, but we've got lots more on our website. So um, for sure, check that out. Sorry, I was muted. Um, just telling people to ch uh, check out our resources. We've got lots of great resources on our website. Um, we have a, a newsletter where right now we're doing some really interesting roundup of park news across the country. It's all very uh, relevant and pertinent to what's happening right now as we're in this unprecedented time and really important to kind of understand what's happening in our, in our parks. So uh, we also have a national Facebook group uh, that's uh, got both French and English conversations going on. So an interesting platform over there. Um, and just uh, be sure to keep in touch. Reach out at any time if you have more questions. Uh, thanks again for your time today. Thanks to both Natalie and Dave for all your uh, interesting and important perspectives on this. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, when you exit the webinar, there'll be a brief survey. It would be super helpful if you could fill out that survey. Let us know how we did and have a great afternoon. <laughs>